our uh, team analysts. Uh, and in our panel, we have uh, four team analysts that work in the Swedish Elite League. Uh, we also have Sean Tierney with us uh, that represents a company that works with these teams. Uh, Petter Kornbro that we have here from Lexand. Uh, Petter has um, been in the SHL for the last six years, um, but in Lexand the last three years. We have Patrick Hall, who's an institution in uh, Vecqua, has been there for 10 years. Uh, we also have Eric Lignel, Furlunda, uh, nine seasons. Uh, and then Eric uh, Wilderoth, who's in Fadiestad, worked with uh, his program Hockey Lab, but also with now Fadiestad. And then we have Sean Tierney, uh, represents Sport Logic. And uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome to the conference. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. Good to have you. Uh, to start this off real quick and easy, we have 90 minutes to talk uh, back and forth and to use this opportunity to speak to each other. But I'd like to know, the first thing is, when did you get, in, when were you introduced to analytics for the first time? And when you saw analytics, did it kind of bite you and say, this is something that I want to do? Or is it something that you've grown with and moved forward with? Um, Petter, if I ask you the question first, when did you realize that analytics was actually something useful? I think it was, um, I can't remember what year it was, but it was one of those um, NHL seasons where you had one of those teams that were, you know, vastly outperforming their um, metrics. It was Minnesota Wild, I think. So this is like 2010-ish, maybe. Uh, and then there were a bunch of nerds online saying that they could never sustain this uh, pace. And I think they completely fell off and missed the playoffs uh, or something like that in the second half of the season. And then I, you know, sort of sort of went, uh, hmm, maybe there's something to this. And then, uh, you know, started reading blogs and on Twitter and online and all that stuff. And then uh, um, eventually started getting into doing it a little bit myself. Sure. Pat Patrick Hall, um, you've been in Vecqua now for a lot of years. When did you first see that analytics was something that was going to be in the hockey world? Yeah, yeah so, so in a similar way to Petter, I've been following hockey, NHL uh, a lot. And if you were very in line in your 2005 to 2010-13-ish, then uh, you got to read a lot of great stuff from from the early adopters and uh, just um, read a lot, read it, everything about the NHL and came across some great articles from uh, some very sharp minds there. So I thought, yeah, this uh, this makes a lot of sense. And uh, that's how I got into hockey, working in hockey uh, after playing is uh, I pitched that idea to, to the staff in Vecco that we can use some of this for for our team uh, in Vecco, and uh, then we built from there. Uh, Eric, like now we have two Eric's on our, our panel, so I'll, I'll use your last name as well. Eric, uh, tell, yeah. tell me how you introduced uh, analytics. Uh, I think it started when I, I started working in Frölunda, uh, when I came together with some smart coaches, uh, introduced me to sort how to count uh, scoring chances and like doing numbers of the game uh, and also of course uh, reading blogs reading a lot of things on on the internet and uh, and also when i start working with petter uh, he introduced me in Corsi. i think a lot of stuff he was writing about and doing so we have a collaboration for a couple of years and i think we learn a lot from that uh, eric wilderoth how about yourself when did you get into the world of Analytics. Can you hear me there? Guys, I, I'm the rookie in this game. Working? And with data. Yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Can I change my connection? Can you hear me? Yep. We'll let you change ah. your... Eric, we'll let you change your connection. We'll get back to you. Um, Sean, uh, you represent Sport Logic here. Um, uh, when were you introduced to uh, analytics for the first time? I think I'm lucky to have been added to this group because I've worked for a team along the way as well. So, sort of trying to tap back into 
the interest I have, much like the rest of the group here. I think hockey analytics is still new enough that we're all around the same age, I think, just sort of judging by our faces. And we're all talking about a question that we had about something going strangely in hockey and then trying to find the answers by looking a little deeper than how many goals are they scoring. Uh, for me, there are a couple of touch points, but the one that I think really drove me forward wasn't that long ago. Um, it was when Andrew Hammond playing for the Ottawa Senators, the Hamburglar over here in the uh, NHL, went on an incredible run with a Senators team that had no business going on a run like that. And I remember thinking, is he the best goaltender in the history of hockey or is something else going on here? And how can I answer that <laughs> question? Um, so that, that for me was a point where I thought I need more uh, information. I need more stats. I need to dig deeper. And there's a compelling story to be told. And I think, you know, whatever number of years later this is, that's still the motivation for me. And, and I think probably the way it sounds for a lot of our group here, it's those questions and wanting to answer them with more than he really wanted it or she really, uh, you know, dug deep 110%. We want an answer. We want something measurable. And uh, that's what drove me forward. Places that you've started. Now I see that uh, uh, Eric Wilderoth has joined us. Um, when did you get into yeah. the idea of analytics for the first time? Uh, I'm sort of the rookie in this gang, I would say. Uh, around 2016, I created my own prediction model for the SHL. Uh, I'm, I'm really not a hockey guy uh, in my roots, coming from other sports. But I uh, started to realize that my model outperformed a lot of uh, experts. Uh, and then I asked, why is that the case? And then I dug deeper and uh, found that, oh, wow, it's a, it's a community out there on Twitter. Uh, I have to join it. And from there, it's... Uh, been a blast. We just got to hear uh, Professor Schulte take it to what I consider to be a new level um, of of ways to analyze and to see situ the different situations. Do you guys understand when Professor Schulte was talking about what he was talking <laughs> about and the ways that he predicted the future to happen in each game or in each situation? Do I, have sure. to, do I have to ask one of you to take, take their, to jump in there? <laughs> sure, Petter, why don't you jump in there? Well, it just felt like you demanded an answer, so someone had to give it, right? Um, I think, but Eric, isn't this kind of up your alley? Be a little... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm coming from the, the machine learning part, so I would say that I, I understand the part of the model, what the models are about, and... Uh, but the problem is that, as you addressed, Mike, how do we uh, give this to the coaches to work with uh, and not just a fancy stat to work uh, up in our analytics department uh, uh, and get that translation on the way is, is the hard problem with this uh, a bit more complex models, uh, so to speak. Anybody else want to have anything to put in there? Patrick? Yeah, it was a great presentation, and um, like Eric said, uh, that's the challenge for all hockey teams, I think, that how to make these uh, very smart people uh, inventing new models and coming up with great stuff to predict the games or predict player performance, how do we make that actionable for the teams? And that's one of the uh, most important questions for the analytics community, I think, to break that barrier, to make it easier for coaches and easier for people to understand what things actually mean, what things actually are used for. Because a lot of teams, most teams are using a lot of this stuff, but I don't think um, we're just scratching the surface of we, what we can do both publicly and within clubs because we have to package it in a way to make things actionable. Eric, yeah. I saw that you want to get in yeah. there. Yeah, I, I think when it's like uh, Eric Willert uh, said, I think it's uh, if you have like a model, uh, really good and advanced, if if you should translate it to coach, uh, they want it to be much better than uh, counting points. So if you if you count points, it's good enough, they think. So if you have a model that's close to a little bit better, it's not good enough, I think 
to to use it. Uh, that's I think a problem for when you translate it to culture. Now I'd, I'd like to put in there um, the idea of, of understanding, but but Sean, this is what you work with, and and uh, obviously uh, Professor Schulte was talking about a lot of different things that they can do. You guys obviously also are trying to find new ways to predict what's going to happen in the future. Can you give us a little insight on that? For sure. I think um, you know being in a group of team analysts here and tapping into that piece. You know, sport logic is working in that space of machine learning and using uh, models to predict you know, the value of a shot as a simple example. Um, I don't have a professor in front of my name like Professor Schulte does. So um, I'll always sort of bow to the experts who are creating these models and who are looking for the right inputs. But I really think that the piece of the conversation that interests me from, from Eric and from Patrick is that it isn't useful for a team unless it can be communicated in a way that makes sense. And that is the real challenge as we start to gather data and models that can give us predictions is how do you then take it to your coach or take it to a player and say, here's what you should do. And not only that, uh, how, do we, how do we make sure expectations are realistic on what we're actually modeling and what we're predicting? If I tell you the expected goal value of a shot is 0.6, what does that mean on the ice? What does it mean when that shot doesn't go in? And I think there's a lot of communication that's like the insulation around the brilliant ideas of Professor Schulte or SportLogic's models to make sure that we keep that bridge uh, very open and alive between the data and what it says and the communication and the, the action that can be taken within decision making or with uh, within play on the ice too. It's a, it's a great thing for, for me to think. Now, I, I moved from the United States where I played college hockey uh, in the late 80s and I came to Sweden. Uh, and there was a head coach and an assistant coach. Uh, and then all of a sudden we had a part-time goalie coach and they said to the part-time goalie coach, hey, after a couple of years, you can also do the video work and, and, and cut videos for us. And then all of a sudden we got somebody in the gym part-time and then we got a full-time uh, equipment man. And then all of a sudden I read that a couple of you guys are assistant GMs on your pro in your programs. So you've gone from not being existent in the late 80s now to being probably uh, the number one or number two people after the head coach and, and maybe the assistant coach as far as influencing a hockey team, the GM, obviously. Um, tell me what's important for you guys. What's the most important thing when you use the different analytics that you try to convey to your players or to your coaching staff um, to make your team better? Buy-in. It's that about buying in. It's about buy-in from from your manager, from your coaching staff, um, that there's a you know an acceptance um, to use this stuff. Um, because if there isn't, then there's literally no point. I think uh, if an uh, if an organization wants to get into this and wants to use uh, you know have people doing this, then you need buy-in, and you need buy-in from from whoever the top person is. If it's the GM or the uh, vice president or or um, whatever is playing. I think that's the number one most important thing because otherwise it's more like window dressing, right? How, and that's how not going to make. How do you get them to buy in? Well, I mean, you have to convince them of the validity of the of the field, right? Um, I think in our case, I mean, Thomas obviously did hockey lab it with us. Um, first first season and, and had been a fan of it. Our GM, Thomas uh, Johansson, he had been interested in it and used it in your garden uh, previously. So there was a natural link for us. But um, I mean, if we go back a couple of years further, when, when I was in Ferlunda with Eric Lignell, and then that was all brand new, but it was also maybe on a m much more basic level that, you know, conveying how, how course it worked and shooting percentage regression uh, wasn't that complicated but if you're gonna like professor schultz stuff if you're gonna convey that that might take a little bit more mental preparation to to uh convey that i suppose patrick and vecqua um 
what do you guys do? What do you guys use in that situation to help the players? And and what is it going to take for you guys to stay in the position where you are? Is it also buy-in from your end, or is it something else? Yeah, I think the buy-in uh, is obviously obviously key part, but that's on us in our roles. I think as much as it is on the coaches or the GMs that we have to convince them that the things we do or the things we find or whatever opinion we have based on the stats or whatever chart we put in front of them, that this gives us a competitive advantage, that this is something that's going to help us win because everyone who works in hockey is interested in winning. So when we find a fancy chart that we work out that says we need to play better to be a top team in the league or we need to change this or that, and we really need to not just put an Excel sheet in front of them and say, this is how it is, but we also need to find a way to communicate how we can use this information and um, change things because this is what's going to help us more in the long run. So that's one of the key uh, key things for us in our roles, uh, working with the coaching staff or working with recruitment, that we need to work as hard on uh, communicating in what ways this will help us win as much as we need to dig out the numbers. Now, you're in an interesting situation where Vecqua's head coach, Sam Hollum, for many, many years was in Vecqua and now is going to go to the national team. Um, but the buy-in, is that a part of, part of the re recruiting process and has that been a part of the recruiting process as well for, for your head, the new head coach? Well, uh, fortunately, uh, our new head coach worked with us as an assistant for a couple of years back. So the um, transition period is hopefully not going to be as tough as it would have been if we got somebody brand new. Um, I don't think that has any worth of, of its own to have a, a coach that's like, oh, I love analytics and all that. You just need to have a smart pe person who uh, understands the concepts of winning hockey games and Hopefully, if he's smart enough, uh, we can agree on a lot of things. Eric Lignell, uh, you have uh, a coach there, Roger Runbody, that's been in Furlunda for many years. Um, how do you get him to uh, use the value of analytics, and, and what do you have to do to, to make that happen in your club? Uh, I think it's uh, first he's really interested from the start, so he's open-minded. Um, then I think it's for me it was to show him and the other important persons that are good enough uh, by doing a great work uh, and also of course uh, like Peter said uh, you need to the uh, Patrick said uh, you need to always show them this is good because it can help us to win it's not just numbers uh, because I think most of the people they hate numbers but they love to win and that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's the main part, I think, and I also I, I also think that it's important for us uh, as analysts that we don't only see ourselves as producer of stats uh, and analyzers. I think we also need to see us as leaders because we can help um, help the, our colleagues. In my case, my uh, Roger and my the assistant coaches and goalie coach to be better to analyze the game. Uh, so I think we need to also see us as leaders to, to coach them every day to be better to look at hockey. Um, so you can have a, a little bit more uh, importance than just doing the stats. Uh, Erik Wilderoth and Färjestad, you came in uh, not even a year ago and were a part of that uh, their championship and you had a lot of um, uh, accommodation from uh, Richard Wallin, the general manager. Um, did you even have to work to get the buy-in or was he with you right away and brought you in and, and listened to you right away? Uh, he brought me in on an interview his second day on work. Uh, so <laughs> I think he... He, there were no problem with the buying part there. Uh, he really wanted to work uh, data-driven and fact-based uh, in his decisions and also to, uh, give the coaches that uh, assistance to their work as well uh, to work uh, more data-driven and understand uh, how to win games and why we wasn't winning games at the moment there. 
Sean, um, you talk about um, getting people to understand um, this idea of buy-in or getting people to accept it, the analytics. Again, I understand for myself, um, coming from old school at this point, um, how, how do you get teams to understand or players to understand? Is it, is it showing them more, showing them the technology behind it, or, or proving that the, the analysis is more right than it is wrong? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think Petter hit it right off the bat for us that the buy-in is key. I think there's a couple of ways. One is, and I'm not sure, you know, if, talking to the other analysts here, I think getting that one that one win, that one success, that one touch point that can hook a staff into the value of using data to make decisions. Sometimes you just need that one story of a lineup change you made based on the data that worked, that turned into something tangible that a staff could see. And if you've got something to hang your hat on, it makes the conversations easier and easier. I think Patrick pointed out data visualization along the way too, or fancy charts. Um, that was sort of my entire introduction into analytics was through charts. And I think those are really powerful. Um, thinking back to, I was a teacher for a long time before moving to hockey full time that visual can be really powerful for different audiences to get some buy-in and um, you know, you're hiding a lot of numbers behind a single visual that can tell a story. Uh, but thinking through the lens of a provider working with these analysts and the teams that are represented here, I think analytics connected to video can be very powerful for motivating that buy-in too. When you can click on a shot with a certain XG and see it and know that the data is connected to a real thing that happened on the ice uh, when you can click on different metrics and then see the video clip see a playlist just making sure that that connection between what really happened and how it gets measured that that connection is really strong i think that helps with the buy-in too and you can continue to make it as real as possible for gms for coaches for players for whoever when you guys use this um, with your teams, you sit down with your players and you talk to them, your coaches, uh, what's your most important and the best thing that you can use in the programs and help us out and, and give us a little bit of your background that we're not fighting for a Swedish championship at this point. So, so we still got about 11 months until the next Swedish championship comes. Um, Patrick, what do you use the most? I mean, when you sit with your players, this is, this is important. Is it losing the puck in the, the mid zone? Is it getting the puck in deep? Is it controlled offensive blue line? Um, what do you like to use? Yeah, so it's uh, interesting that you ask that question because uh, the way it works uh, with us in Vekwe is that me on my end and uh, GM and the coaches, and we gather the information and we don't really convey a lot of numbers to the players when we're working with them. So typically the coaches will find something or get something from me that they find interesting and then whatever that may be that uh, this deep pairing isn't really good at retrieving the puck or they have a problem when they're picking the puck up with the pressure on both D men and then they'll watch video clips and convey it that way. So we use our findings to communicate that to the players, but not really saying to them, oh, 75% of this and that, this happens. So it's more about finding the information and finding the source of failure or source of success and and then uh, translate that via the coaches into video to then sit with the players. So, so it's your translation then of, of the numbers and then you put it into an, a concrete actual situation and, and try to explain it to them, something that's that's maybe easier to understand or, or to put it into to actual use. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to make it too complicated for our players, and we also don't want to dig ourselves into any holes to uh, making things too complicated for ourselves either. So uh, what we're really about with all the analytics and all the data that we work with in one way or another is to help, help us uh, find things that are actionable. So whether that's that we're not creating a lot, but we're getting a lot of uh, power plays and winning that way, but we need to improve our five-on-five -five play. Uh, then we make something out of that. Or like I said in the example before, if we find something in a deep pairing that needs to be addressed, then uh, we can look at the video because the numbers say this is uh, horse shit. <laughs> so 
Uh, we need to look at the video and see if we can correct things or if we need to make some adjustments with the deep pairings or whatever it may be. You've obviously learned the, the American or Canadian uh, way of for a defensive coach to say this is horseshit. That, that's, a, that's a good <laughs> comment. What about your other guys? Do, do you, you guys also put the filter on? I, I, I interpret Patrick saying that they use the numbers, they filter it through something that their own knowledge or your own knowledge, uh, talk with your coaching staff and then tell it to them in a different way than 75% or 25% more of a, a filtered response. Is that what you guys do as well? For alumni, yes. Eric? Yes, it is. I think we have uh, like a couple of filters. I'm the first filter uh, working with the uh, most data and, uh, numbers, and then I filter it to my coaches um, and present something. And then I think, like Patrick said, uh, we transform it to, to video. Um, and then we can talk with the players. We can't use, sometimes we use the numbers to like coach the players, but I think it's make no sense if you can't see it on a video. Uh, so yeah, we have a lot of filters and with the players we work with video, I think. Now, before I ask you, Petra, I've been in hockey teams and, and there are some guys in the teams that want to know everything and they want to they wanna see the stats and they want to see the reasons behind it. You have some guys that say, hey, don't even talk to me about it. I don't want to hear anything about this. Just leave me alone. Let me play my game. But other guys want to know everything. Petra, how do, you, how do you deal with one player who wants everything and another player that says, hey, don't talk to me about this. I, I don't want to get myself all mixed up. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have a fairly similar situation going here where there's like a chain of command, you know, we talk to the coaches and then uh, coaches talk to the players if for whatever reason, good or bad. Um, but sometimes there are players that are interested and then it's, in these cases for me personally, it's been more like, you know, curious people that sort of think this numbers and stuff seems kind of interesting and cool and, and whatnot. So it's, it's been more like that rather than necessarily, you know, making an effort to improve a player who's having issues or whatever. But sometimes it's been guys with no confidence that just, just need a boost and, you know, the shooting percentage dried up or whatever, and they, they just need a, keep going, uh, doing what they've been doing, and it's going to turn around eventually. But it, I think players, for the most part, they, they, they're they used to a certain way of working and, and, and being like, like Eric and, and Patrick said. You know, coaches handle most of the communication or a video coach handles most of the communication that way, and then that's sort of how it's been for us as well. Not really... I'm not really in there poking around too much with players. It's more like I see my my role as like greasing the wheels for the coaches, you know, trying to direct their energy and their efforts and, and focusing on the right thing so they can uh, take it from there with the players. Eric, uh, Fadi Astad, uh, you were there again just for a, a eight months before the championship came. Um, you and Thomas Mattel, a new coach that came home from North America, uh, your relationship, you guys also filter it. And did he have a different way of seeing things after his years in the NHL? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's quite a ride. First, I had another coach, uh, Pena Bourne, who was uh, um, not a numbers guy, I would say. So the, one of the first thing was to make it easy, as Patrick said. We cut all the numbers. The players didn't see the numbers. We changed it to colors instead. Four nice colors uh, is... Uh, is our metrics in having the best color, all the nicest color, uh, you know, all our 12 metrics, uh, then we should win the games. If we don't, we are unlucky. Uh, but then Thomas came in. Is it, Sorry? Is it green or is it purple? Uh, it's actually blue. It's the <laughs> nicest. <laughs> yeah, but then, then Thomas came in and he's a bit more of a numbers guy, so he, he actually wanted to go back to have some numbers uh, to give context to the players uh, more than uh, nice nice colors. But but uh, make it easy, as Patrick said, uh, is, is very important uh, when you talk to players, I would say. Uh, they're not... Uh, the numbers doesn't say that much. Colors say more, actually. Uh, so that's... Uh, I don't want to say speak to them as they are kids, but uh, make it easy. 
Sean, this has obviously got to be something that's uh, Sport Logics. Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges is, is finding the right filters and the right way to communicate without understanding uh, Sports Logic uh, analysts become Chinese for the most uh, players. Um, do you guys work a lot with that, with the different try to, ways to try to filter the, the information? For sure. I think, you know, our UI is something that uh, the group here would have you know, access to, maybe something they use, something they use more or less than one another. Um, our UI is? Uh, sorry, so ICE, the platform where we display the data that we're collecting and try to um, contextualize it, put it into different segments, different pages to make it accessible. Um, that challenge of making it digestible it's three steps before anything is even available to the analysts that we provide it to. Um, you know, trying to chop down on decimal points, trying to make sure we've aggregated the right pieces together, um, what they're able to grab from the API, if they're an API user and accessing the data that way. There's a lot of curation that happens in the steps before team analysts are even grabbing at the data. Um, and so, you know, Eric's talking about colors and again, you know, sort of singing a song that I've sung for years that I think um, anytime you can bring that context and show less decimal points and more clear takeaways of better, worse, uh, good, bad, met expectation or failed to meet expectation, anytime you can aggregate it in that way, I think you make it more digestible. And I hope that that's what winds up happening for team analysts. That was my experience. Um, for sure. But I just wanted to toss in before I let this one go, um, much like what Petter was saying, in my time with a team and in this role dealing with analysts and teams, um, certainly, you know, you don't connect with players, I don't think too much. And I never wanted to. I didn't think that that was something that offered a lot of value to say, you know, 30.67% of the time this is happening to you on the ice. It's not an actionable takeaway for a player. Um, but face-offs, for whatever reason, are that one place where you can say, here's data and center, centermen, they want it. They want to know their numbers. They don't mind if you got a couple decimal points tacked onto the end too. So for whatever reason, that's the unicorn in, in analytics where you can take a chart and decimal points right to a center on their face-offs. And in my experience, they're, they're willing to talk to you about it. Uh, obviously, there's a history in that with, with winning face-offs and things like that, that everyone uh, thinks that's where it starts, but that's a great point. Um, you, you, you bring up um, another thing that, that is, is an interesting uh, point to all of this, and, and that's uh, the difference between forwards, defensemen, goalies, um, and in different situations. Um, you guys that are the team analysts, do you work with your goalies as well? Uh, or do you let goalies deal with goalie coaches because that's a totally different sport to be playing in the net as opposed to being a player that is either on defense or on forwards? Um, Fatty Astaud, what do you guys do? Uh, Eric, what do you guys do there? Do you have a different person that works with your goalies and does the analytics, or do, do you do that with your goalies? Uh, our goalie coach was our uh, hobby analyst before I came in, so it's, it's a, still his... Uh, puck so to speak uh, but I, I help him with the data I help him create a model and also a report uh, that shows uh, gives him the information he needs to address the goalies with as well Perlunda how do you guys do it? Uh, it's the same it's uh, the goalie coach area and I can help him with with data and if he needs some help but it's he's doing the analytics for the goalie have uh, with two out of two at least is that it's a different sport forwards and defensemen are yeah, one yeah. sport and a goalie is a different sport is that your feeling patrick yeah uh, i would say that's the same feeling as i get from uh, eric and eric so the goalie coach is the expert on uh, why things move the way they move <laughs> in net and uh, we can uh, support that with some data from time to time but always with a caveat that I'm from speaking for myself at least. I'm not as certain about things uh, when it comes to the goalie stats as I can be with uh, with the scare stats. Petter, what do you guys and Lexan do? Do you guys the same way, or do you get to be both uh, analytics for goalies and for forwards and defensemen? Um, yeah, I mean it's pretty 
pretty split up between, you know, goalie coach handles. I mean, I, I do all the numbers, of course, but um, then also help him out with, um, you know, working with him and, and doing just the basic stuff. He needs to uh, be actionable about it and, and, and work with his goalies. And to a certain extent, I think it's the same with both the forward coach and the, and the, and the D coach. And, um you know, procuring some some special numbers for them that they need, uh, be it PPPK and all that stuff. It's, I think it's three sports to be honest, not two, but three sports. Uh, we've received our first uh, question in our chat site, so and you can send in questions, obviously, and I, and I'll read it for you guys. Uh, the analysts translate the models to the coaches, etc. However, the way from research to an a to analysts. Do the analysts also speak to the people like Professor Schulte, or do they read the papers, or how do you guys keep up to date with the newest technology? So, so the question being, do you guys go to the people who have actually created the models and discuss it with them and learn more about the models, or do you accept the models as it is from Professor Schulte and other people that do it within SportLogic or in different places? Um, where do you guys get your knowledge from? wants to pick it up well eric from furlona you guys always say that you guys are first out in a lot of things so so where do you get your knowledge from hey i, I first i have been into uh, the university world for a couple of years and uh, there i get a lot of a lot of information and also i think i i'm looking for new not only in ice hockey i, I use uh, football as a as my knowledge um, i think they are uh, really, ah, they are better than ice hockey and have done this uh, for more years. So I think there is a lot of knowledge to catch from the football, uh, both statistics and tactical and stuff like that. So I, I read and I talk with them. I met and yeah. Do you have do you have contact then with other teams in your home city Gothenburg or other places around Sweden or other other places around the world for that matter in different sports that you communicate with? I have a couple of of, uh, of people in other sports, soccer, football, uh, that I talk to sometimes, and share some knowledge and ideas. Patrick, uh, what about you? Do you do you, do you go back to the university or or try to find a way, uh, call up Sport Logic and say, "Hey, I don't understand this. Give me more information," or uh, other ways of of learning about uh, the analysis uh, tools that you're using. Yeah, I think just try to uh, to educate yourself any any way you can. So I read a lot of stuff. I talk to a lot of people in uh, in hockey, people working in the NHL, people working in the SHL, uh, people who are doing good work or aren't attached to a team. Uh, those guys are always easier to talk to because they they can actually tell you about it. Uh, so um, try to to stay current and uh, also think of uh, ways together with your GM coaches, other people that, okay, what would we want to do if we don't didn't put the limitations on ourselves? Like, what would we want to find out? What would we want to have as a tool to uh, use numbers to understand things and kind of try to work from there. And uh, sometimes you meet a dead end and sometimes you come some part of the way, uh, but, it's important in this business, like if you look 10 years back, we we're looking at things that we would all laugh at now. So uh, it's important to talk to people, read a lot, educate yourself. I think that's I think that's progress and, and development when you look back 15, 20 years and, and can laugh at yourselves. Now, now at, the, at the same time, you guys are uh, oh, five of uh, or four of, of the teams in Sweden and almost all of the SHL teams in Sweden have someone that works with analytics in one way or another. A very few amount in the league under. Um, if we go down to Switzerland, a lot of the Swiss teams have it as well, the German teams, obviously the NHL. But in the, in the end, we're talking probably a hundred people that are uh, fully focused on this job. It's not a huge place to be and it's not a great way to, or a huge market to find, find the information. Uh, Pet, are, are there conferences that you're invited to or do you go around the world and see people or ha call up Sean and say, hey, Sean, I need help or maybe even one of Sean's competitors and say, hey, I'd like this. How do you guys feed the knowledge? 
Well, I mean, this is the first conference, so uh, I suppose yes to that, but it's also the, the only conference <laughs> we've been to. Um, COVID kind of put a dent into that. Uh, had some high-flying dreams of maybe going to the U.S. and whatnot, but then uh, things happened. Um, I mean, we have obviously, I think go, going back a bit to, to the previous question, it's also like get smart friends. Uh, I think the European community, when it comes to this field, is extremely undervalued. Um, there are a lot of smart people out there who most definitely should be working for teams, um, but they're not because it's a, you know, relatively speaking, there aren't that many teams. Well, there are many teams, but maybe there's not as much money um, and they can make a better salary in other fields, uh, unfortunately. Um, so, so that's a great area to get help just from the very smart people we have out here in Europe and also, you know, North American people, like Patrick said, with the NHL and um, a lot of people like, like uh, I mean, Patrick is the OG, of course, but for those of us who've been in the field for like 10 ish years, I mean, a lot of the people that we sort of know from online and, and, and I mean, they work for NHL teams now, so you have connections and uh, people you can ask and talk to for that. Um, just, you know, stay in the field. For a long time and you will get connections. Sure. Um, another question. Um, how would you advise coaches if one of their demands would have a low value, statistically speaking, uh, and possibly time consuming? Um, in other words, low value, um, uh, hard to get at, and it takes a lot of your time. Do you guys sit in discussions with your coaches of what we want to analyze and what we want to know, or do you talk more in terms of certain players? Um, where's the focus on, on spending your time? Because your time is obviously limited as well. Uh, Fadi Astar, uh, Eric, what do you say? Uh, I would say not on player level. Uh, of course, in European ice hockey, it's not as in NHL where we can trade players back and forth. We have we have what we have basically in our roster. We can add some, uh, lose some, but uh, in fact, that has been more important to uh, look into part of the game. And as you say, sometimes it comes requests that uh, you know from the start that this will take uh, my whole day watching these clips and. Uh, it won't be any value to the team. Um, and I try to uh, address that. But in the same way, uh, I'm new at my job. The coaches is new. It's a learning curve as well. So sometimes it's just to do the hours and prove that it has no value as well. Uh, to f doesn't find things is also uh, a learning. Uh, and for the coaches as well to understand that this thing that you're looking into, that you're focusing on, uh, doesn't add wins to our team. It uh, We should focus on other things, basically. I, I assume that all of your coaches are, are uh, curious about uh, learning new things and give you a lot of different tasks to do. Um, that communication, obviously, has got to be something that is important that, that you can use your time at the best. But I've got another great question here. Um, how much of the work that you guys do do you see as being long-term and how much of it do you see as being short-term? So short-term, uh, a day or two or maybe the next game, and how many think of long-term for six weeks, maybe even half a year, or maybe even a season? Um, do you guys see your work as being, can you split it up into long-term, short-term? Petter? Uh yeah, I mean, certainly some things are, are time sensitive and, and, and just, you know, has to be completed. Um, and then we have, at least I do, I have several, you know, sort of projects. And it's, since it's off season for us now, it, it's pet project season two, you know, where you try to develop new things. And I suppose that's the long term stuff. Uh, for those of us who, who do a lot of scouting as well, I think. That sort of falls under the you know long term stuff when it's you know roster projections and 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 um, contract outlooks and, and that sort of stuff too, which um, probably falls under the long term area, right? So uh, I think especially early early on when I when I got to Lex and everything felt short term because you had to get a new going to say a new system up, but a new way of working up. 
Um, and as that has progressed, you know, through the years, when you get experience and you get processes that you can sustain, um, you can sort of move on from from doing like these short term things because they're sort of automated and, and kind of handle themselves. And then you can move on to focusing on on more long term stuff that you can go to your boss and say, you know, this is going to help us um, several seasons, but I just need to invest a lot of time in this right now. Um, so. Um, I think the longer you do it, the more the more time you can um, manage your time and get into the longer term stuff for sure. Eric, you're about to jump in there. For a long that. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's hard to like split it to long term, short term, but I think it's based on the season. Uh, in pre season, you work really much long term because you have nothing to do sh- short term. And uh, then when you play, when you are in playoff, it's only short term. And then you have a lot of like thing when you like October, November. I think in my case, I I do a lot of work short term because I'm responsible for the pre scouts and and the game plans and stuff like that. But I think it's a challenge for me to be able to work long term because I think it's good to work long term even when you are in like game of the game of the game because if you only work short term I think uh, then development stops a little bit um, so uh, it's 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 hard sometimes to work long term for me but I think it's important uh, develop in the future um, where do you guys think that analytics will go down to will we go down to the j20 programs will we go down to the j18 programs will we be scouting for our hockey gymnasiums at the 15 year old level and go into those situations uh, where do you think that uh, this could i don't want to say end but where this could develop and take the next step anybody want to jump in there i think we will get colleagues <laughs> I think we have. I think we will have like uh, one analyst for the for the physical part, and one for scouting, and one for tactics, and that's what I think. And, uh, and how many years? Ahead, how many years ahead do you think we're there? Oh, if I say five years, I think it's stiff. We have more analysts than today. I think. Patrick Hall, what do you say? Yeah, like Eric said, I think uh, it's just going to expand. Uh, like you su- suggested, Mike, that we're working with the junior players and uh, in another way that we're doing now, we find uh, ways to kind of uh, use analytics to hopefully predict some of the um, uh, younger players, how they will take steps and uh, can use it more for that. And as we see in soccer, I think it's more developed there for the strength coaches and the um, physios than it is in hockey, and we can use it there. And we probably have someone who's just working with the scouting and recruitment and someone who's working like Eric is with the pre-scouts and the uh, day-to-day operations with his coaches. So, uh, And then um, hopefully some smart people working on uh, new ideas and uh, new ideas and uh, research and development as well. So... Uh, for good and for bad, uh, more new colleagues to, to work with and uh, challenge the way we think. <laughs> uh, Eric and Fadi Astad, uh, will you guys have a, a few more analysts in a couple of years? Uh, yeah, I hope so. Uh, for the moment, we're recruiting a scout as well, so I not need to do that part so I can focus on analytics uh, for the moment at least 100%, and that's that's not bad. It's a big step, I think, to do that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, the future. You know, I heard New York Mets have like 34 people in their analytics department. Uh, we are a one-man department here, all of us. Uh, so I don't think we will be 34 people in five stuff, but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll be two or three people in five years. Yeah, uh, well, it, We're much more efficient than they are anyways. They can do one yeah. job. They need thirty-four. <laughs> this must be music in your ears, Sean. I was just gonna say uh, to jump in on it. That's that's music to our ears because I think the data that's available to these clubs, we're just scratching the surface of what can be done with it. And so, if any uh, GM working with any of the analysts here wants to talk to me and ask 
Should we have more or less analysts? I'll uh, gladly take that call and let them know exponentially more. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to blow out what the data is. The data is only going to grow. We're talking about how analytics is going to filter down to lower levels of the sport as well. Uh, in terms of you know taking in the video and producing statistics, as long as there's a camera in the rink, this is possible to do. And so the limits of where we can collect data, it's a public policy question, but not a technology question. And so to be ready for junior levels growing their data departments and then teams having more analysts and Eric being one of 34 one day in Fariestad, um, I, I hope that we see our, our teams expand and expand and um, that'll help push us forward as a provider to make sure we keep our data offering growing so these teams can continue to get more insights out of it. So uh, please do set your GM GMs up with me if they want that call. I'll, I'll let them know you need a team of 10 working under each of you. Well, the, the, these guys are, are soon to be the GM, so, so you can talk to them directly. <laughs> uh, and actually, we have a question in the, in the, the chat, which you brought up. I, I think you brought it up there when you said public policy, um, privacy rights, um, filming in an arena. Ca can we film whatever we want and then analyze it? And, and can, we, can we do whatever we want with that data? And uh, maybe another step, how much can we do with the players, younger players? I mean, is, it, is this an issue when we're discussing, as you said, public policy? Right. I mean, fortunately, it's not um, not a hurdle that we've run into yet at all, where we have professional and amateur hockey, where we have broadcast games, and and this is how the, the process is done. But if we're looking at that really long view, and I'm interested to hear what our, our team reps have to say here, too, when you're talking about the feeder leagues that these teams are looking for prospects from, those leagues have feeder leagues, too. And I think it's really incumbent on, on us to say, this is the level uh, below which we're not going. This is the level above which uh, we are going and to set that. Um, but, you know, I didn't run for any, uh, any political office, so it's not a decision that will ever be, uh, you know, put to me. But curious to see just sort of what the, the sentiment is with the, the team reps here. Um, you know, how far we want to take it. I think the next levels are obvious. We've got, you know, many years ahead of us before we run into that wall, but it does exist in the long term somewhere that we run into it. Do you guys have any thoughts about that, the four of you? Um, has it even been a discussion of filming um, teams or players or analyzing them? Has that been something that you brought up? Anything discussed in VetQuip? Not really, no. All shaking your head, uh, Eric. For Alonda, you're the only one I didn't see shaking his head. So, uh, are you thinking about it, or or did uh, nothing that's really come up just yet? I I think we have to think about it. Uh, I, I, we have like discussion. How much should the junior see? How much should we just have for the coaches? And I think there is some questions about it. We need to to ask. If I turn it a little bit, um, the idea of, of scouting, um, all of you have talked about you've had maybe even a scouting role uh, previously or as a part of the, the job that you've been doing. Um, at the same time, you say to me that, that you talk to your coaches and use it through filtering to help players. How good of a tool is this for scouting? I mean, the analytics, can, can you break down each player um, with the, the, the data that you guys have? Um, to make really good choices in scouting? Are you helping your GMs or the ones who are doing the scouting do a better job at it? Petter, what do you say? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, Eric, I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, sorry. Yeah, I, I would have to say it's my first season of season. This I, I, I don't know if I'm helping him make better or worse decisions. Last year, so you got a big, big shoes to fill. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It uh, can only be worse, right? <laughs> no, but uh, we, we are ex working a lot with data in the recruitment part uh, for next season. And uh, it's a puzzle, uh, for sure, uh, where we try to use data, uh, and data-driven recruiting, basically to complete the puzzle and make it as, as beautiful as possible. Petta, you're about on your way in. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's absolutely amazing tool to have when it comes to recruitment. My my role is sort of 50-50 analyst and scout, so I use it uh, an egregious amount, uh, quite frankly. And the level, like the amount of time that you can save um, is is probably the biggest part for us where I, like we, all of us sort of act as a filter towards uh, our coaches, but I also act as a filter towards my GM uh, when it comes to the recruitment. So, so like sort of boiling, like we get 50 AHL players or whatever, and I'll boil it down to the seven or eight most interesting. Um, having the data is tremendous for that. It, like, I know some of us know what it was like watching AHL live like six years ago. It was torture, uh, unedited, you know, video wasn't clipped. Um, they filmed some dumb Jumbotron. Um, but right now, I mean, we have shift data, we have event data, um, all the stuff we do with the SHL data, we can do with the AHL data, for example, and then um, just, you know, sending out the clips, like watch these clips of or these shifts of this guy and, and, and we'll have a discussion like um, it's really the game changer for me personally, uh, maybe more so than like like the analyst data, um, because you can cover so much ground um with this data when it comes to recruitment um and i think it also it's i think it's a huge um benefit to to have you know both the scouting and analyst role as i have because you don't run into this classic you know eyeballs versus data stuff um i can't really have a dispute with myself <laughs> you know so so it all boils down to, you know, finding the best possible player for the club and, and making the best possible recommendations and, and having both, you know, eyes and data for that is is absolutely key. Eric, for Lundy, you're on your way into this discussion. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, of course, I think you can do a lot of good things by using data when you scout uh, and recruit uh, because more information, you have a better chance to make a good decision. And uh, I think it also can help uh, not doing the bad decision. Uh, maybe you can uh, don't sign a player uh, according to data. Um, I'm not so involved in the scouting or recruitment uh, area, but I think it's important with data. Uh, same as in for us in the coaching staff, we need it because it helps us to make better decisions. So I don't think it's a question of if it's good or not. I think it's uh, you need it. Potter, I think uh, you've been in in Vecqua and from the last ten years, um, your team has gone from uh, oh, not really being a part of the SHL, but then winning a bunch of championships. Has this been an important part of the process of of recruiting players? Yeah, I would say so. Like it's uh, always like uh, Eric said, it's better to have uh, more information. So we always use it as a uh, one of the areas that we cover. We uh, try to watch them live if we can. We watch them on video as much as we can. But with analytics, we can uh, filter through it a little bit. Uh, as you're aware, we're not. Uh, at the top of the food chain, so we don't really know in uh, in January what players we can we can look at for the summer. So uh, we have to be able to look at a lot of players and filter through a variety of different leagues to find players, not just focusing on this and this and this and, and follow them from from week to week. So we need to be able to uh, have an opinion of hundreds of players, uh, and then maybe maybe next summer this guy if he has a so so season he will come to Europe <laughs> and give up on his NHL dreams for that time um, and also even the hardest working scouts if uh, me and Petter or Eric is uh, sitting in the office all day we can watch five six seven games and uh, there is no way we can watch all 82 games so data is a great way to kind of uh, get the whole picture if we're watching a player and uh I woke up feeling great that day. Maybe I'll I'll have a an opinion of a player that he's creating a lot of things. But when we're looking at data from Sean or from ourselves or from our uh, various sources of uh, data, then 
we can say this guy has only scored the one power play goal that I watched, so maybe he's not that good of a power play threat anyway. So it's uh, it's always a great tool to kind of um, check yourself and uh, try to combine the two the two uh, different ways of uh, getting information on the player into making the best and most informed decision possible. Now, now we have we have Sean with us from Sport Logic. There are, there are uh, other companies as well that do different things. Um, do any of you, any of you teams work with the psychological aspects um, of a player, health, um, uh, where they're at right now as far as motivation um, or, or anything else that measures more of what's inside of a person's head as opposed to what they're doing outside of their body? Um, a question here that, that was very interested in, and uh, is there any data analytics that, that can work with, with motivation or health or uh, other things that you guys use? That's a really interesting question. Um, the really short uh, answer is no, but I think the more interesting medium length answer is, um, I think often of hockey graphs, uh, which is the place I think all the analysts here would know as well. And I often think of an infographic that was shared there from uh, Garrett Hole and Mike Fail several years ago, where analytics doesn't measure the inputs, the heart, the grit, the leadership, but it measures the outputs, the uh, line carries, the expected goals, and we can measure the end results too, the goals, the wins, the saves. And so I really like that breakdown for me, thinking as an analytics uh, a stats provider, what can we measure and what can't we? do we even need to measure the size of somebody's heart or their motivation? If, if I can measure what it translates to on the ice, that's the part that we're really concerned about anyway. But I would point to the fact that at least in the NHL and, and I'd let the SHL experts speak to it. I know that advances are being made in tracking injury recovery uh, data, like biometrics data. We know there's tracking data in the NHL that's becoming really popular um, for tracking, you know, player routes and uh, distance skated and all that sort of thing. I think we are on the precipice of having data where we could start to say, here's the fitness level of this player. Here's their condition relative to their benchmark condition in these different ways. Some of those pieces, I'm always going to be hesitant about the idea of measuring somebody's leadership or heart or some of those more psychological things. I know that'll be outside my expertise as long as I'm in hockey. Um, but there are ways of measuring the hockey outputs that we, we do want to measure. And I know there's that biometric space that, um, you know, NHL and SHL clubs will be moving into in the next few years as well. Now, if I, if I take that a step further, Sean, and ask the, the, the representatives, from the, represent, representatives from the teams, uh, do you guys measure heart rates, practice time and game time? How many teams? Hands up if you do it or not. Nobody, nobody, sometimes. nobody wears it. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, yeah, with a, with uh, something around their chest here, yeah. and then at practice time, I remember a lot of players yeah. that didn't like him in practice because they didn't want their coaches following them too closely, how much they were working or, or not working. Um, mm -hmm. But that's kind of become come obsolete now that the players wear them. Um, anything else? Do you guys track anything else? Um, meters that they skate or or things of that ma ma that matter? I mean, their output, as Sean was talking. Not yet, but we're talking about it, uh, I think, because if you look at football, they do it more than we do. Uh, I think we have a couple of areas that we are not so. When we get uh, Sportlogic in, we, I think we're really good with tactical and technical stuff, but we have the physical, the physical part and also the mental part, but I, I don't think we can measure the mental part, especially not the public as the other numbers are because we can't share them uh, with everybody so but i think we have like if you talk about like positioning uh, see how players skates how they move on the ice uh, that's i think the next step if you talk about analytics i think we have a lot to do there if I, if I go to one of my pet peeves for, for many years that, that I was no better at than, than, than anyone else, but, but um, the idea of, of hiring a hockey coach or a hockey player without doing actual test, their mental capacity. Um, in the business world, 
you would never hire a, a CEO or a president of a company without doing a certain due diligence of the person's background, her uh, past um, jobs, and, and maybe even some kind of psychological test to see how well they do. Do any of you guys, before you recruit a player, ask them to take a psychological test to see if they do well under pressure or if they, they can handle the, the, the situations that they may be put in? as would you would in the business world um, with a person who is oh, being paid a fair amount of money. Um, I guess that's not relevant in the case, but, but still um, an important question. Um, the psychologicals, do any of you guys do a test, written test for a, for a potential player coming into your organization? Nobody? Uh, I, I'm just no, as bad. No, I was 13 years in Lean Shipping and I never did any, not one time. I hired coaches and things like that without doing it. So I, I don't think it's a, I, I just think it's an interesting step. The next step is the psychological day side of our testing. I think it's important for us, but I want to talk about how we do with it. <laughs> but it's important. Yeah. The mental part. Anything you guys could think about taking your GMs and say, hey, we need to do psychological tests of our players. No one else does it in the world as, as far as I know. Sean, I don't know if you know of anybody that does a, a psychological test in a recruiting process in the athletic world. Um, soccer or, or other, other sports around the world, do you know of any? I mean, from my lens, no. I don't have anything great to throw in on it yet. But um, again, I think it's one of those fields where we're going to see growth. Um, I, I still, from my lens, will continue to prefer to stick to the measurables of the on ice production and infer what that means about what a player feels and thinks um, and try to keep that boundary fairly strict for for the role I play right now um, but I think any enterprising company that you know offers that kind of service uh, I'm sure the teams get approached with this kind of thing already and and there may be something to glean from it but for me I, I really do prefer I want to measure those those things that happen on the ice, the things that impact, you know, measurables that we can speak to and and leave the other part kind of out of my purview, at least, you know, famous last words. But that's that's where I fall for now. Any thoughts from anybody? Yeah, well, uh, for our draft eligible players, then uh, there's lots of questionnaires and the interviews to um from psychologists and uh other people so to the N to the nhl yeah and when i was working with florida and uh, we had uh people coming in and uh sending out questionnaires to the prospects as well so it is used in uh for the draft prospects now, Sean, I, I just just to go against you a little bit. A lot of what you guys do is is produced estimated uh, chance of things happening. So so it's it's a process of trying to guess what people are going to do or, or uh, through data, obviously, and and put that forward. I I just think that the psychological background is going to be an, an interesting, as you say. Um, someone will pick that up in the near future. Um, now we talk again about policy issues and privacy and things like that. That may be something that we. Um, have in the future. Not part of this conference. Um, you guys go down in the locker room, middle of a period or middle of a game between two periods. What do you tell your coaches? Do more of this, do less of that. What do you guys have in your conversations or with your GMs? Don't tell me none of you, none of you guys go down in the locker room in, in a period and say something to your coaches because I know you all do. Not anymore. <laughs> what, what did you say before? <laughs> no. Nah. I, I didn't say anything that got me booted or anything, but it's just, uh, I'll let them handle it. They're, they're good at their job. But, but, but you give oh. them information and you tell them yeah, certain I, things, I, this I, is I, happening too often? Um, yeah, a little bit at that point, but, but I think when we also made a coaching change a couple of seasons ago and I sort of made a decision to to let that person do his job as he wanted to do his job and uh, we had a very good season so I, I stopped going down there so I guess it was my fault all along then. Patrick you've been in Vec for many years you've had to uh, go to the locker room between periods and say something boys we got to change this or to the coaching staff hey this can't be any we got to do something different. No actually I don't go, do go down there uh, between periods and uh I try to stay out of there as much as possible, really, to not get influenced by the way they're talking about players and the way they're thinking about 
uh, how things are going. So I think if you can, it's important to have at least a little bit of a step outside of the coach's room so you don't get like caught in finding stuff that agrees with the uh, opinion that is uh, set in the coach's room or in the GM's room. So for us in our role, it's important to to stand our ground and and believe in what we believe or what we find or what we see on the ice and not just cater to their preconceptions or our own preconceptions for that matter. So I, I don't go down there. Uh, and it's probably a good thing that I, that I don't. Eric, for Alunda, you ever go down to Roger and say, hey, Roger, you got to change things? Yeah. Look at the data. Of course, uh, uh, not only the data, I think it's we made sure, uh, some data and, uh, during the game, but of course I do. I That's part of my job to to have contact with the, with the bench during the game. So I'm, I'm involved during the games, uh, and that's a lot about tactical stuff, um, difference in lines and parodies, and if we, if I can see a, a parody uh, didn't manage the puck good, uh, maybe we have to coach them, and I can tell the coaches to do something, not what to do, but do something. They need to play better. Uh, it can be we we can't solve the, their pressure. Uh, we need to look at this, and I look at this in the between the periods, and so uh, I think I do a lot, a lot of work during the games to to help the coaches. Eric, you ever go on to Thomas Mattel and say to him, "Hey, we got to make changes. Look at this data. It's not not we're we're not doing these things the right way." Uh, the distance from the press box down to the locker room is out of my. Uh, I'm not in condition to to run that <laughs> in, in the period breaks. But uh, we have contact, of course, with the coaches and addresses things that. Uh, if something is uh, wrong, if we can see if we, we don't follow our KPIs uh, in some way, uh, but but uh, often it's very high level things. If we see uh, we don't shoot to, uh, enough, we, our inner shot, the slot course is really bad today. We need to uh, fix that or stuff like that. Uh, otherwise, we try to let Nitel and other guys do their job. Uh, and they did it quite well the first season, at least. Uh, if we look at um, uh, Sweden, and uh, obviously we've talked about the, the German league and, and Swiss league that, prob that have uh, analytic coaches um, on their staff. What do you guys want to improve? What do you guys want more of? Um, talking to Sean here in SportLogic or to any other of uh, the companies that, that work in the business. Um, What's the next step for you guys? Um, you must be sitting there at some point and say, I'd really like to know this, or I, I'd really like to have this information. And if you're not the one doing it, I would assume your coaching staff at some way, somehow is saying, hey guys, we want to know this. Can you give us a, some examples specifically of this is what we want to get better at and understanding? Uh, first of all, of course, we would like tracking data as well uh, in a set shell. Uh, I think that's a couple of years uh, ahead and it's uh, it will be more complex and we will be, need to be more people within the analytics department then as well. Uh, one thing that I really would like is to have open data uh, from a set shell uh, so we can get more people working with analytics uh, as hobby projects to get into it and challenge us within the teams as well. Uh, now it becomes quite a gap between uh, the data that SHL provides and what we actually have within the team. So it's, uh, yeah, a lot of us comes from hobby projects or uh, working with data. And at the time that we started, uh, we had almost the same data as the team did have. Uh, so it wasn't that hard, but now it's, uh, yes, yeah, some more open data as NHL has uh, event data for uh, uh, for, for people to start working on their own. I get like 10, 20 people has contacted me to how do I get into the field? And I do have to start working on something. You have to uh, test, do stuff. And uh, yeah, it's hard when you don't have open data to, to try stuff. Petter, what does Lexon need? What do you guys need to improve? What statistics or data can you have use of? 
Um, I think both Eric's kind of touched on it that I think tracking data when it comes to like positional data. Right now we have a with sport logic sort of like the light goes on every second and we know quite well where the puck is at all times and uh, whatever the puck carrier is doing and we might have a guy doing a you know uh, gapping up or whatever but but for the most part we have no idea what the other skaters are doing on the ice uh, we usually know where the goal is but it's not that's also something you know when it comes to an xg model or or just player performance, just figuring out, you know, what the goal is doing relative to the puck. Um, so I think positional data will be huge. Um, and it's also going to be, like Wilder would said, it's going to be a couple of years uh, away. Hopefully the NHL has done some work on it already at that point. So we will have a decent, you know, starting point. Um, otherwise, it's going to be a bit of a slog to get something useful out of it in year one for sure. Patrick? Back with Lakers, what do you guys want? Yeah, like the others said, uh, the more data that we get uh, our hands on, the more interesting things we'll get. So we can work more with uh, with skating speed and puck velocity and angles and positioning and uh, find new interesting ways to, to improve that way. Uh, and also, as we touched on before, uh, there are other areas of the of a club with uh, regards to travel and uh, how we work out in the gym and um, and things like that. It can be interesting to expand on and just really to work with the raw data with uh, to experiment and find new ways to ask ourselves questions that we haven't answered yet. How can we look at this and how can we look at that? So I'm uh, confident um, that we will find uh, new ways to uh, challenge each other to to improve uh even with the with the current data that we have from sport logic and others now now i have to ask a follow-up question there what do you mean by travel practice and things like that yeah well so that's uh, out of my area of expertise but the way we optimize travel should we travel on the day before should we travel by bus or go uh, and pay a little bit extra to to do charter flight what's the best for recovery what's the best for performance how can we can we play 70 plus games in a season and and maintain as good a quality as uh, as we can and is it more important to put the dollars in that department than it is uh, to get an extra d-man for instance so things like that to uh, improve the way we analyze that kind of thing so not just the actually on ice performance you're looking at things that are outside of the ice um such things that that our sponsor stretch does or oym does measuring the body and re uh, the time to recovery and um if you're on a jet plane or if you're on a, a lower plane and a sob 2000 that flies at a lower altitude is that what you mean as far as the food they eat and things like that yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, I think uh, the people in this panel are working mostly with the on-ice uh, analytics and not a lot of that stuff, but that's certainly an area that the uh, Swedish uh, hockey teams can improve upon, I think. For Linda, Eric likes to try to be a, uh, in the forefront and, and take charge and show things. What, what, what would Ferlunda want to have as far as the next step? I think it's like Peter talked about uh, uh, positioning data should be really good for everybody because it's like a, a gap right now. Uh, if we if we talk uh, look at Sport Logic, we have a lot of really good stuff. But if we can, especially include in the same system, it would be really interesting. And also tracking data with the uh, speeds and uh, high intensity skating and stuff like that. Can we have it in the same? Uh, in the same system, for example, in SportLogic, I think it should be really interesting for us because we have it's easy to uh, to analyze if we have it in the same system. Um, I'd I'd like to uh, finish up with uh, what I consider probably the most important situation um, with uh, analytics, and and that would be then the development and the future. Um, have any of you guys gone a class? course at a university or anywhere else gone to some kind of group setting where you've learned more about analytics or have you guys all done it pretty much on your own 
Has anybody gone to a class at a university regarding analytics? Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I am a computer data engineering uh, uh, degree. So I've been to the university for five years uh, doing this. So I, that's how I started out working with data for companies and uh, uh, basically found out that working with sports is much more fun than working with uh, enterprise data. Uh, so, yeah, I, I come from uh, another direction, right? So, so you came from analytics world, but not athletic analytics and definitely not hockey uh, analytics. Exactly, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So my first model was the, exactly the same that I did on a, uh, a, a transport company. And I just uh, used the exactly the same machine learning model on ice hockey data, and it worked quite well. So, And uh, yeah, it's games every second day, every third day, and it's quite more fun than doing something for a company where you can see results within a year or two, uh, I would say. Uh, so. That's real appealing for me to work with in sports, winning games. It's obviously a, a good um, good feature to work on. Anybody else had a class in Yeah, analytics? I came from, I, I think I came from another way. I came from sports science. Uh, so I started with sports science, uh, studying leadership um, and fitness training. And then I became an analyst. So... I think uh, the opposite against Eric. I came into the sports from the sports with, and then start to look at numbers instead of start with the numbers. Peter, Patrick, anything? Have you guys studied this? Nope. Uh, I think, I think, I think, it was think you, we Peter, all come said, from... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I think we all come from... Uh, it's kind of funny because we all come from quite different backgrounds. I mean... My history degree isn't much use here, but it's, uh, you know, uh, I didn't play either. So we have some guys who played, some guys who didn't play. Some went to, um, went to university doing something like this. Some of us didn't. Uh, so you can end up here in, from quite different paths, um, for sure. So if I'm 22 years old and I either at a university or think of going to uni or not, and I love sports, and I think this with analytics is just really, really interesting. How do I get into the business? Any other thoughts? Call you guys up and say, hey, please let me work for you for a while, for free, for a season or something? I think I'll, I'll jump into it really quick. I think sure. um, Thanks, Sean. Eric uh, pointed to this earlier, that the public work that gets done um, is probably still in this field the number one way to build that network and show a portfolio of work that you've done, of questions you've asked, which is just as interesting as what answer you wind up with ultimately, I think. Um, but there's a lot of room in this field because it isn't 100 years old. It's 20 years old, maybe. It's, maybe it's younger than that even. So being out in public, finding what you can as a hook, a question, and producing some work um that's a great way to get in and just like petter's saying I, I don't think any of us have the exact same background and we're all here on the same panel uh talking about the same topic so i think that's actually really encouraging that there's so many routes into this industry from wherever you are um including being in some other job already but, but you do need a portfolio you need to show that you can ask questions that you can produce some kind of answer um, and then, you know, conferences like Lynn Hack, that's another way where you can get that exposure and that networking. Hockey is very much a who you know relationships business still. And those contacts you make, the people you meet, those uh, emails you send that you keep kind of alive between people in the field, between a portfolio and those networking opportunities. I think that's the advice I would give to somebody who's 22 and looking to, to break in. In the end, it's still mathematics, statistics, and and uh, percentages. So so it's it's not that far off from a lot of other things. As as uh, oh, Eric, you talked about with your biz start in a different entire world. Yeah, yeah, how, exactly. 
How much do you guys collaborate with each other? Uh, you don't figure something out. You, you, you can't get it. Something's just not fit. Would you guys go to each other at a game when you're sitting at the same level? I know you all sit up uh, way up high and sit down and look. Would you go over to somebody and say, hey, Patrick, I can't figure this out. Something's screwy about this. Or would you say, no, I'm not going to talk to my competitors. We're too, we're, we're fighting. And I don't mean to do it right in the playoffs, maybe in the beginning of the season or even in the summertime. Do you guys talk to each other about improvement? Well, I think if uh, if someone's uh, video feed goes out or if someone has trouble connecting to the Wi-Fi, we'll help each other out, but not with uh, building a, a model or finding something that we think the others haven't found or tipping them off on the player. I, I don't think uh, we're helping each other that way. Do you guys, uh, the other guys think the same way? You're not going to help each other? Heck no, we're going to try to win the championship. I'm not going to help anybody. I think we can create an environment where we help each other with the right things. So not, uh, we will never help each other with tactics and exactly models and things like that. But I think we can be more like the goalie coaches to develop together, I think. What do you mean? Do the goalie coaches work on a different, yeah, they, different level? They, yeah, they communicate a lot. They have the comments together, uh, working a lot together. But I don't think they, I hope they don't share everything. But I think they help each other to be better. I think it's a possibility for us too. Uh, our time is running out. Um, Last thoughts, uh, Sean, um, you're from the business side. Um, anything that you'd like to give us a last 20-second uh, um, input? What, do we, what should we think about either sports logic or analytics as a whole? I would just turn the camera back around on the people that uh, I sat with today. I think this is a really good group of analysts that were brought together today to share some thoughts. So it's um, been interesting for me to get to see some of you live for the first time and hear about how you're trying to use analytics with your team. Um, and again, I think, you know, what are the takeaways from a conference like this? Uh, it's that there's a lot of roots into hockey. There's a lot of smart people working in it, but there's a lot of ways to get into it. Um, and I hope that this leads to conversations for some of the, the participants and viewers today that they go out and they try something and they share their work and they connect on Twitter or whatever it is, much like uh, each of us have kind of along the way. Peter, Lexan, what's the last word from from uh, your area? Oh, it was great to be here. Um, fun to seeing all these guys that I know. Uh, I know all of you guys going back a bit, some further than others, but it's been, uh, yeah, it's been great chatting and, and uh, maybe we'll do that information sharing thing uh, after all, you know, ask people ask each other more um technical stuff maybe um not so much lineup choices but um we can definitely work together a bit more for sure eric from karlstad uh, last uh yeah yeah i agree we have completely different backgrounds and uh, i think we could help each other with stuff that doesn't actually converts to wins, but uh, an easier day uh, way of working with uh, the data and stuff like that. Uh, but it's been great chatting with all of you. I, it's a shame that we can't meet in person yet. It would have been great to grab a beer after this panel, but uh, we'll take that next year, right? Thanks. Patrick, uh, any words last minute? Mm, yeah, well, for anyone uh, watching along here, and uh, we think that we have a good grasp of uh, anyone interested in this in Sweden and Finland, but, but whenever you do, a new new name pops out, so um, feel free to reach out to, well, I think I speak for all of us, but reach out on Twitter or find our emails or ask questions, and as you said before, the teams are always looking for volunteer scouts or uh, people interested in the projects and there are lots of things to help out with if you want to get a taste of the business so uh, feel free to reach out and um, contact us um, and also a big thanks to Mr. Lambrix and uh, Van Bloom and uh, Linköping University for arranging this. Thank you. Uh, Eric uh, Gothenburg, one last input. Oh, It was really fun to be here so I'm glad for the chance to be here. 
Uh, thank you for being here. Um, and if I'm going to put my last uh, two cents into this, um, I would say that the business world that you guys are in, um, and even in sports, if we were to add on to football and, and basketball for that matter, it's still a very, very small world. And, and the idea of sharing information, certainly not in a game situation or in a playoff situation or a, 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 a deciding factor between two teams playing each, each other, but learning from each other, growing the business in my world is um, probably the best thing that you guys can do other than working for your teams. Um, Swedish hockey, European hockey um, need to put themselves in a forefront and, and you guys are all the way in the forefront leading the, the, leading the way. So thank you for joining today. Um, this discussion is now officially over. Uh, we will have a 15-minute